Golf Smarter number 592, published on May 16, 2017, is brought to you by Radio Baseball Cards, the latest podcast from Smarter Podcasts. Radio Baseball Cards are the greatest baseball players of the 20th century telling stories about their lives in and around the game. This week, Radio Baseball Cards features the thoughts of Pete Rose on who is actually the greatest baseball player ever. Now, just my two cents, but I think that when someone is banned from the game and from the Hall for life, they should be eligible for induction to the Hall of Fame after they die, not perpetuity. We're talking about his life, right? Radio Baseball Cards is now available in iTunes, the Apple Podcast app, SoundCloud, or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. A more consistent golf swing is simple by just focusing on the club, not your body, with Ed LeBeau. This is Golf Smarter, sharing stories, tips, and insights from great golf minds to help you lower your score and raise your golf IQ. Here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Ed. Fred, it's a pleasure to be here and talk with you about a subject that's really important to me. Yeah, well, it should be important to a lot of people, but we're going to we're going to educate them and tell them why. And I appreciate you coming on and reaching out to me um because you went back and heard one of the episodes that I recently did, actually that I recently published. Um episode number 564 was a rebroadcast of a interview that I did in 2009, episode 187. And it was with Manuel de, uh, de la Torre. And um, I brought it back because I had read that just last spring he had passed away. And it was such a powerful interview. He was so good. And he's given so much to the golf community. I thought it was worthwhile to bring it back. And you discovered it. I was, uh, I was inspired by it. Oh, thank uh, you. It's the case that um, I've known him for um, almost 20 years. And over those years, I've just uh, always found him to be the just penultimate golf professional and the most remarkable golf expert that I've ever run into. What he knew about the golf swing, and more importantly, what he knew about how to teach it to people was just superior. And he didn't make this stuff up. He had amazing training, too. He did indeed. Uh, his lineage goes back to Ernest Jones. Uh, Ernest and his father, his father was befriended by Ernest. Uh, he came over to this country, and uh, they began collaborating about the golf swing. Manuel was young and picked it up and learned it basically from his father. And he and his father would spend hours hitting golf balls at each other and taking notes. Right, his father, uh, an, learning an about hell or what the club angel. does. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and he and Angel just uh, um, spent a lot of time studying and. He learned golf from trial and error, from learning what works and what doesn't. It wasn't theoretical. It was all pragmatic. Mm -hmm. And because of that, uh, his knowledge is just so effective with regard to helping players play better. Can we talk a moment about Ernest Jones' teachings and when he was around doing this and what his theories were? Sure. <clears throat> Ernest really came to prominence because of an accident that he had. Uh, in World War I, uh, he lost his left leg. Oh. And as a golf professional, of course, that's considered to be career-ending. Sure. Because there's so many things that you would think that are required during a golf swing that are so dependent mm -hmm. upon having two legs, such as the old shifting your weight. And upon being released from the hospital, he went back to the club at which which he had previously been employed, encouraged one of his friends to carry the bag for him, and he went out on the course in crutches just to see if there was any way that he could still play. He'd been away from the game uh, doing in military service, in the hospital losing a leg, goes out to a golf course and shoots 82 the first time out. Wow. Comes back and shoots 78. Oh, okay. <laughs> I can see and, the fluke, but wow, that's not a fluke. Yeah. Uh, shoots 78, and by this he's puzzled, Fred. He can't understand how it's the case that he can play so well when he can't use his body the way that he had previously used it. Right. 
And the conclusion he came to is that it's not about the body, it's about the golf club. And so what he began studying is, well, what is it that the golf club needs to do? And in so doing, he opened up a whole new approach to golf instruction. The prominent way of teaching at that time and continuing to this day is body-focused instruction. Teaching what the elbow should do, teaching what the hip should do, teaching what the spine should do, what the knee should do, etc. And what he found out was that there was an alternative to that. And what has come to be known now is that that alternative has been scientifically been proven to be far superior than body-focused instruction. Please go on with that. Well, there are some, <laughs> well, there are some researchers out there, uh, probably most prominent of which is a woman, uh, Gabriella Wolf, out at uh, University of Las Vegas, University of Nevada at Las Vegas. And UNLV. what she has found in all sports, not just in golf, is that if a player will turn their attention to the club, or the baseball bat, or the racket, or the hockey stick, if they turn their attention externally to what they want to accomplish versus internally, that they wind up performing better and they wind up learning faster. Huh. And of course, this is at the heart of what Manuel taught, and that is he taught people to pay attention to the golf club. And in so doing, uh, it's now being, as I say, scientifically validated that it's just far superior. And when you think about it, Fred, there is no tool that you or any of our listeners have ever learned to use by being explained how the body should function. Not a comb, not a scissors, not a fork, not a shovel, not a broom. There is no tool that we've ever been taught to use, not a screwdriver, not a plier, not a wrench, by someone explaining how the wrist and the elbow and the shoulder and the hips should move to use that tool. On all of those tools, every one of them, Fred, everyone, we learn to use it by seeing how the tool works. And humans are one of the few species that use tools, and we have a special ability in our brain that if we see how a tool works, our brain will then send the right signals to the muscles to operate the tool. Mm -hmm. It's how we work as humans. When you and I first learned to use a spoon, mom put the spoon in our hand. And she began to feed us. Now, we were so young, we had no language ability. But we're watching that spoon. And pretty soon, we see how the spoon works. And now we can take the spoon and put it in our mouth. We learned by seeing how the tool works. That's how humans work. And interestingly, Fred, there are no tools that we've learned to use by explaining how the body works, except for one. Golf. Let me guess, yeah. <laughs> and it's the one tool that has stymied us so much and the reason it has is we've tried to learn to use it backwards we've tried to learn to use it how the body functions instead of how the tool functions it's a very simple proposition and is the bottom line to all this that the tool you know by being externally focused on the tool the club is that we just want to have the club square at impact? Or does it go, is that like the bottom line with a lot more behind it? Fred, you're, you're hitting the nail right on the head. What we want to understand is that the club should do certain things, regardless of whether you come to Heartland Golf School, regardless of whether you listen to this podcast, regardless of who you take lessons from or where you play, if you're going to produce an effective golf shot, the club has to do certain things, has to do has to do certain things. And the problem is, is that most players don't know what those things are. And they're not complicated. You see, if we could do a survey now to all of our listeners mm -hmm. and ask them, have you ever hit a good drive? Have you ever hit a good approach shot? Have you ever hit a good putt? Universally, everybody would say, well, yeah, I've hit some. And what the problem is, is that this demonstrates that they have the ability, Fred, what they are lacking is repeat ability. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason why they can't repeat. And the reason comes to this issue. Fred, a very good shot and a very bad shot have something in common 
for most every golfer. What those two extremes have in common is that most golfers aren't sure what produced either one. <laughs> I'm sorry for laughing because it's so true. <laughs> Fred, we could go to any driving range right now and watch a player hit a very nice shot, wait around for a few minutes and have them hit a nice, not so nice shot and ask them, what was the difference between those two? And Fred, I have to tell you, we're not going to get much in the way of an answer. No, we're really not. And I, my one of my all-time favorite lines is when um, – Warming up for a round on the course and, and, you know, next to my playing partner and that we're both hitting balls and they say things like, oh, wow, that went well. well I don't want to leave these on the range. I got to take them out to the golf course, you know, and they're saying, OK, that was two good shots in a row. I'm done on the range. I better get out there now so I don't lose. It. It's like, what are you talking about? What does that mean? Yeah. What is it they're going to lose? Right. Because they hit the good shot. But if you ask them. It's interesting. You and I go out on a golf course right now, and we're standing behind a bush, and we watch a fellow hit a very nice shot up to the green. And we walk over to the player and ask them, what did you do to produce that shot? <laughs> what is it? Because that was really swell. What, what did you do? Fred, the explanations we're going to get will be so bizarre if we wrote them down and looked at them later. And they have so little to do with what really happened. Right. And I would assume that probably 80 percent, you know, I'm throwing out a number, I'm making it up, more than half the time, uh, it's going to be, the person's going to say, well, because my elbow was tight or because it, they're going to talk about what their body did, not what the club did, right? Exactly. Exactly. And the thing we need to bring, we need to do is when you bring this conversation to the point to ask what is it that exclusively controls the flight of the ball? And of course, it's the club face. The club, yeah. The club, yeah. Um, we could say that many players would would subscribe to the idea that having a straight left arm is a significant part of the golf swing. Keeping that left arm straight, Fred. There are training aids there are for lots that. Of golfers, <laughs> there are lots of golfers that don't have a left arm, oh. and yet they play pretty well. So how important is having a straight left arm? Not. Nah. How about this one? How about the old flying elbow, the chicken wing? Sure. You know, you know, uh, I can't tell you the number of lessons that have probably been given teaching a person to correct that flying elbow. Yep. Well, two things. Number one, there was a guy named Jack Nicholas. He had a very flying elbow. But second, there are a lot of players who play well but have no right arm. So how do they protect that elbow? Hmm. You know, shifting your weight. Ernest Jones is a classic example of that. How can a man on one leg shift his weight? Yeah, without falling over. He shoots 78. <sighs> wow. He could probably putt really well. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, uh, here's one. How about keeping your eye on the ball? Now, that's got to be pretty important, right? Sure. Except oh, blind Fred, golfers. You're going to bring up blind golfers, aren't you? Yeah. Yes, you are. There's 2,400 of them. Yeah. And they have holes in one each year, Fred. Yeah. Yeah. So let's cut to the chase. The point is this. There are no important body parts. They don't control the golf swing. What controls the golf swing is what we do with the golf club. Now, interestingly, no wait. Turn there, this wait, it, it's, it's what controls the ball flight, not the golf swing. Is that true? Is that, am I am I trying to correct you here, or am I wrong that it's we're trying to get repeatable ball flight or yes. repeatable contact? The ball flight is a function of the golf swing. Okay. In order to get consistent ball flight, we have to have a consistent golf swing. Is that what most students are asking for when they come to a lesson and say, I need to be more consistent? Because, I, again, conversation the other day, someone's telling me I want to be more consistent. I said, well, what are, your, what are your scores? And he said, usually in the, you know, upper 80s, low 90s. I said, sounds like you're consistent to me. 
He goes, yeah, but I have blow-up yeah, holes. And I said, yeah, but you have the same score practically every time you go out. Isn't that consistency? <laughs> you know what he wants, though? He doesn't want consistent scores. Mm-hmm. Oh, he, that would be fine. He wants lower he scores. Wants to have cons- he wants to have consistent ball flight. Yeah. He wants to have consistent ball flight. And the fact is, you can't have consistent ball flight until you have a consistent swing. And Fred, you cannot have a consistent swing until you understand what you should be doing. And if you ask most golfers, show me a golf swing in very slow motion. Show me exactly what the club should do, but do it in slow motion so we can really see it. Yeah, forget it. You can't do it. No. I've been trying, literally, I've been trying that for years because uh, somebody brought up many years ago in my conversation, um, Tai Chi golf. Super, mm-hmm. super slow mo of your swing. Can you do it and do it properly? And I've been trying for years, and I still struggle with that. To do it is not difficult. The problem is most golfers don't know what to do with the golf club as they're moving it so slowly. Right. Does it go here? Does it go there? Uh, do I hinge my wrist? Do I cock my wrist? Do I turn my hips? Mm. Um, most golfers don't know, and. Fred, that brings us to an important point, and that is that for every golf shot, for every golfer, you and I and everybody who listens to this podcast, there are three essentials, three essentials for producing an effective golf swing. Interestingly, I've been doing this for a lot of years. You've been on this podcast for a lot of years. I'll bet you dollars to donuts that you've never had anybody tell you here are the three things that need to happen to produce a good golf shot. I'm taking notes. I've never seen them written down anywhere. It's not a secret. It doesn't apply just if you come to Heartland Golf Schools. And when I tell you what they are, it's going to be a yawn. You're going to say, well, of course. But then I'm going to ask you, have you, when you've been out practicing, worked on these three things? And the answer is going to be no. So here's the first one, Fred. Here's the <laughs> First one, you ready? Yes, sir. The first one is that the ball has to be contacted by the center of the club face. Yep. So let me ask you, as one golfer to another, why do you think that's important? Because of the design of the club, right? I mean, it's where you're going to have the most effective. It's called the sweet spot for a reason. Yeah, good. And, of course, if you lick it, it's not sweet. Uh, <laughs> what the sweet spot really is, is that's, that's where the moment of inertia is where the club is stable. So if you contact it there, the club won't twist. And so the real benefit of hitting in the center, most players will say, well, that's because where you're going to get your most distance. That's not the critical issue. That's where the club will not twist. Right. And, Fred, the physics are, whether you're swinging Callaway or Ping or Titleist or Cobra, the physics are, as you tend to contact that club more and more off center, that club twists more and more, and the ball always leaves perpendicular to the club face. So as that club face twists, the ball goes in a new direction. The ball cannot go down our target line. Cannot. Will not. Even if it's really an expensive golf ball. The club, it has to make center contact in order for the club face not to twist. Now, that's why when Ping came out with cavity back clubs, they began increasing the size of the sweet spot. They've been increasing the stability of the golf club. Uh, but it's still the case that when you contact it off center, it will twist. It won't twist as much as the old days when we just had blades, but it will twist. So the first thing that has to happen is we have to have center contact. Hmm. Does that make sense to you? It makes total sense to me. Makes total sense. I love that. So the second thing is this, and that is that the club face must be square to the target line at impact. You're right. Those two are different things. The club has to be square to the, t- to the target line at impact. And again, if we went to your driving range, I come to I come out to see you, and we go down to a local driving range, and we interrupt people practicing and ask them, are you working on achieving center contact? Are you attempting to get the club face square to the target line at impact? 
spread, again, dollars to donuts. Uh, we won't have hardly any, but out of 50 people, you may have one or two that will look at us where that would even make some sense. But it's so critical. And what they'll be working on is trying to keep their right elbow tucked in or trying to have a good hip turn or trying to keep their left arm straight or trying to keep their spine angle. A hundred things that have nothing to do with this. What you and I could learn from Manuel Della Torre, it's just, it's amazing and it's wonderful. The man was just so insightful. I consider, Fred, his golf instruction to be the poetry of golf instruction. Hmm. Very brief in the words, but very concise in the meaning and highly effective. Mm -hmm. So that's two out of three. There's a third. Yeah, I want to get to that one before I ask my next question. Yeah. And this one, if we went to that driving range and asked 50 people, I doubt if we'd have anybody answer this one correctly. Then please the don't ask one, me. <laughs> <laughs> the third one is this, Fred, and that is the club must be swung in the direction of the target. Oh, so just imagine that you, you and a buddy are out playing catch out in the backyard. If we could take a slow motion, high definition of you tossing the ball to your buddy, there would be a moment at which we could find that your forearm tracked the target line to your friend. If your forearm went a little bit left of the target line to your friend, the ball would go left. If your forearm tracked the target line a little right to your friend, the ball would go to the right. The only way that ball can go to your buddy is if your forearm tracks the target line between you and him. Sure. Are you with me? Yeah, I am. I am. Thank you. Now, what that requires is when you're tossing for you to know where he is. That makes sense. How many golfers stand over a golf ball and are trying to remember where the target is as opposed to staring at the golf ball? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we've had a lot of conversations about target oriented golf and I'm a, I'm a believer on that. Absolutely. But it's the case that, you know, and I, I read as much as, <laughs> well, I won't tell you how much I read because it would sound obsessive, but I read a lot about golf. <laughs> this, you're a golfer. We're a golfer. We're all obsessive. That's why we're here. <laughs> I've never heard it explained that during the golf swing, the golfer should be attempting to remember the location of the target and attempting to swing the club in the direction of that target. If we went to that driving range, almost everybody would be focused on trying to make the club hit the ball. Right. And they don't miss. Right. But the ball doesn't go where they want it to. You see... The ball is an inanimate object. It can't move on its own. It can only move, Fred, in the direction of the energy we give it. Hmm. And so when I'm making a golf shot, I need to remember where that target is out there, and I need to make sure I swing my club in the direction of that target. If I don't, if I swing a little left or a little right, the ball cannot go to the target. Well, then, if you let me ask this one, Go for it. Uh, to get the club swung in the direction of the target, aren't we all now starting to focus on the internal? Aren't we focusing on what our body is doing to make it go down that line? No. No? We're focusing, no, we're focusing on getting the club to go there. Well, the club's in our hands. We are mm -hmm. we are controlling the the movement of the club. Yes. Um, please, Ed, what am I missing here? <laughs> I mean, because it sounds like that. that's where all the instructors go from there is what your body is doing to get the club to move in that direction. Let me answer with a simple analogy that I think will, will illustrate the point. Thank you. You and I are at lunch. You've got a fork in your hand. You want to stick some green beans and put them in your mouth. Do you know what muscles you're going to use to do that? 
Do you focus on your hand and your forearm? Or do you focus on the fork putting it in your mouth? You focus on the fork in your mouth. Right. You see, there's a division of labor here. When we but that's, use that's a small tool, motor movements. That's small motor movements. We're talking about large motor movements. Same thing. Same thing. It works the same. There's a division of labor here, Fred, in human beings. When you walk, that's large motor movement. Would you agree? When you walk okay. and you're going up a flight of stairs, are you trying to think of how your leg muscles are going to work? Are you thinking you want to get to the top of the stairs? Yeah. Yeah. But I don't practice golf as much as I practice walking upstairs or walking. I mean, there's mm-hmm. there's mm-hmm. all there's there's a lot of unnatural movement that goes on in a golf swing, isn't there? No. What's unnatural about it? Well, then you why know, aren't we more consistent? <laughs> The reason is because we don't know what to do with the golf club, Fred. Okay. You see, the way that you and I are wired, the way that all of us are wired is this. You decide what you want to do. You want to sit in that chair. Uh, you want to use your cell phone. Uh, you want to go out and um, rake the front yard, whatever it is. Whenever you are making yourself do something, you never think about what muscles and joints you want to use ever. What you think about is what do I want to accomplish? You see, even though you've been walking for decades, at this point, you still don't know what muscles and joints are involved in walking. Most golfers don't realize that walking is really controlled falling. It's leaning forward and catching yourself, leaning forward and catching yourself. If you want to walk backwards, you lean backwards and catch yourself. But if you ask most people, they won't know that. But they can walk well. We're designed so that we can decide what we want to do And then our subconscious then controls the muscles. It's not a conscious thing, Fred. And when we try doing it backwards and do the subconscious consciously, it gets very awkward. And we wind up with what most people experience in golf. Then let's get right to how. Ah, I like that. (laughs) Because I I don't want to, I mean, we've definitely set this up, um, uh, what the issues are. Now we got to get to and mm-hmm. go right to the how. <laughs> and and the answer of signing up for the Heartland Golf School is a good answer. And for some, it is the answer. But for right now, that's not the answer. <laughs> I'm, there is no information that I ever want to withhold from anybody. My mission in life is to help people enjoy this game. It's been a very good game for me socially, personally, not professionally socially and personally, and I want other people to enjoy that kind of richness this game has. It's a wonderful game. And anything I can do to help more people enjoy it instead of struggle with it is what I want to do. So with regard to the how. Please. So the first thing we talked about is center contact. When we address a golf ball, we're establishing a radius. You see, the golf swing is circular. It's circular. You and I get our most power rotary, rotary, not lineal, not swaying back and forth. So the golf swing is circular, and the center of our circle, the center of your circle, is right between your shoulders. It's the midpoint right here. That's the center of your circle. So that center then, once you set the club down, that center is set. That's the center of the circle where it's tangent to the golf ball. So if you move that center, you've moved the radius. The whole swing arc moves away from the ball. If you move that center to the right, the whole arc moves to the right, and the bottom of the swing moves to the right. Wow. Yeah. If you move to the left, the whole arc moves to the left. If you move forward, the whole arc moves forward. So what we must do to create center contact, the principal factor, is to maintain that center's location. Are you with me? Yeah. Yeah. So if we maintain that center's location, hmm. we have fixed the radius, and we're going to get a lot of center contact. Uh, are you implying that most golfers' bodies are moving way too much during their swing? Way too much. Hmm. Way too much. 
take a look the next time you watch golf on TV and you see the close up where the player's legs are here and the club comes along and hit the ball. Disregard the club and the ball for a minute and watch the legs. The legs, not the watch head? How much, right? Well, it's just it's the close up where it's just the legs and the ball and the okay, club okay. and hit the ball. Yeah. Watch the legs and see how much motion there isn't in those legs. Sure. This whole thing of weight shift is just the worst thing you can do to a golf swing. And yet it's told to almost everybody. And you're back. Yeah. Shift to the right and then load up on your right and fire to the left. Horrible. Huh. When you do that, it generates so much imprecision because, again, the arc of that swing is moving with you. And now you have to time you getting back and the club being in there at the same time. And, Fred, the club is on the ball for three ten thousandths of a second. So how good does your timing have to be? Stupidly good. Yeah. Inconsistently good. Yeah. So with regard to center contact, the key word is balance. Mm-hmm. What we want to do is to sole the club, center on the ball, and then we want to find the balance in our feet. Typically, it's located right behind the ball's your feet. We want to feel like we're set, well, like we're balanced. And then, Fred, we want to practice, and you can do this best without a golf ball, practice making the swing without feeling the weight change in your feet. If the weight doesn't change in your feet, you haven't moved your center. And you're going to get a lot of really good center contact. Wow. Manual delatory, Fred. Manual delatory. You know, let's go to your driving range and ask those players, how many of you are working on, on improving your balance? Yeah. Back in the old days, before when, when touring pros were considered more of a sideshow than celebrities, back in those days, some of the pros weren't even allowed in some of the clubhouses. When they would go to practice, if they wanted to work on their balance, they'd go back into the receiving behind the, behind the kitchen and they would steal mail, milk crates. And it would take milk crates out on the range and they would take three of them. They'd put one under one foot, the other under another foot, and they'd hit golf balls off the third. If you try shifting your weight while you're standing on milk crates, you're going to wind up on your keister. Wow. Nowadays, what the tour pros have is they have a little uh, um, soccer ball that's about a third inflated, and they put one under each foot and hit golf balls to improve their balance. Interesting. As you might expect in my profession, I'm often asked for a golf tip. My favorite tip, because it's universal, is that good balance is the unsung hero of a great golf swing. Very important. Yeah, I was just reading this weekend about uh, how seniors, gee, why would I be reading about that? Uh, How seniors lose distance a lot, um, mainly because of balance. I mean, there's flexibility too, but they, they are not as balanced and they have trouble standing up without falling over sometimes. But I mean, we're talking about extreme seniors. But balance is a huge part of it. The thing is, not only do we get center contact, but when we're balanced, we will also feel more comfortable in generating more speed. Mm -hmm. As you tend to lose balance, you're going to slow down to regain that balance because balance is so critical for our own safety. You see, a human being can kill themselves just by falling from a standing position. So all day long, there's a little program that works in your brain and mind that tries to balance us, tries to keep us balanced. Mm-hmm. The converse of this is if we set up and we set up with our weight with a little bit on our toes, when we go to swing, that balance program is going to want us to get balanced and we're going to move back to get balanced. Now we're too far away from the ball. We're going to catch it on the toe. Mm-hmm. If we set up a little bit too much on our heels, that same balance program that keeps you balanced all day long works on the golf course. Now it's the case that that balance program is going to get me off the heels. And I'm going to be too close to the ball. I'm going to hit it off the heel of the club. Balance is so, so important for center contact. And center contact is so critical in order to put the ball on our target. Hmm. I'm blown so away. That's number one of three. Yeah. Yeah. Is this good stuff or what? I wish I could take claim for it. It's manual delatory. Yeah. It's manual delatory. Well, thank you for, thank uh, you so much for continuing his his lessons why aren't more teachers doing this why aren't they they why isn't he on the pedestal that so many other (laughs) players are it's not really the people that are on pedestals from the all-time greats are not necessarily coaches they're players 
But exactly. you know, for the rest of us, it should be coaches. So why is he not? Why are there not statues of him? What happened was this, Fred, with regard to the early, early days and up until now, body focus instruction became so prominent because of this. Unlike all the other tools that you and I have learned to use, the golf club is very thin in profile and it moves very fast. And so we weren't able to employ the normal means that we would use in order to learn how to use the tool by watching how it works. It went too fast. And so the default was, is you know, when Harry hit that golf shot, his belt buckle was pointing at the target. The next time I make a golf shot, I'm going to work on my belt buckle. When Frank made that golf shot, his left arm looked like it was straight. I'm going to try straightening my left arm. <laughs> we tried copying all the body characteristics of players when they were making good shots, thinking that if we had copy them, all 132 of them, that happened in two and a half seconds, that we'd make a good golf shot, except it doesn't work that way. What is fascinating, Fred, is when I have a player accomplish these three things, the body produces all the motions that you would normally see. The body motions are a result of what we want to do with the tool. When you use a fork and your elbow raises up and your hand comes to your mouth, those body motions are a response to you wanting to use the fork. Just imagine if we tried to teach people to use a fork by explaining how the body would work. We'd have a lot of skinny people. <laughs> you know, imagine, I mean, it's, it's just, it's learning to use tools backwards. And it makes golf so difficult. I have players all the time that sit around uh, my table and tell me, you know, I've been good in tennis. I've been good in baseball. I've been good in basketball. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a swimmer. But this game, yeah. not this game. And this is the reason, Fred. So let's move on. So center contact, balance. Balance. Got that? Yeah. Let's move to the next one. Square contact. That club is doing 80 or 100 miles an hour. How do you get it square? How do you get it square to the target line at impact? How do you do that? Well, there's two things that accomplish it, and both of them are done at setup. So is balance, by the way. It's done it set up. What I like about what Manuel teaches is that of the three things, two of them we take care of and set up. We stack the deck so that those things happen. We bias everything so those things happen. So that when I make the swing, there's only one thing to do. So here's the second one. So with regard to center contact, how do I accomplish that? By two things in my setup. Number one is I center myself on the golf club center myself on the golf club. Wait, when you say center yourself on the golf club, uh, are you talking about the club face, the club head? No, the, the club shaft. The club shaft. So if, I draw a line from, if I draw a line from my nose to my navel, that club shaft is in that line. Okay. Okay, I'm with you. So let's delve into that for just a moment. Why is that important? If you take your hand spread and put them in front of you, like so, Yep. and you move them from your right to your left, you'll find there's one point during that arc where those hands are going to be perpendicular to a target line that would be in front of you. Right. And that one point is when they are in your center. center. In the center. You're going to put a lot of teachers out of work, you know. Oh, I hope I put a lot of teachers in work because it's a wonderful game. I wish people would just just dive into this and have a great time. It's a wonderful game. So that's half of it. So the center con, the putting the club, in, putting our center on the shaft is one factor. The next is is the ha- is how we hold the club with regard to our hands, how the hands are positioned on the club. What we want is a neutral grip. Okay. A, a neutral grip. Explain that. What is a neutral grip? Good. A neutral grip is basically when the palms are facing each other. So if you hold the club, the pocket of this hand is facing that way, and the pocket of this hand is facing this way. Or, for those people who aren't watching on, on video, if we look down at our hand, what we want to see is the Vs formed by our thumb and forefinger are pointed up at our 
our chin. Up towards our chin? The V. Yes. Now, most golf articles that you read suggest that the V should be pointed over your right shoulder. What that produces is that produces a very strong grip that's going to hook the golf ball. And the reason the Vs are taught over the shoulder is most instructors are scared to death that their player is going to start slicing the golf ball. So they built in a little anti-slice hook. Mm -hmm. Well, the solution for a slice is not a hook. The solution for a slice is straight. And so what we want is a neutral grip. Mm -hmm. um, if you put your hands on the putter, there's a flat spot on the putter surface. Mm -hmm. When you put your thumbs on that flat spot, your hands are in a very neutral position. Mm -hmm. And the reason that flat spot is there is that in that neutral position, we tend not to twist the club face. Mm -hmm. And so if we use that same, that same modus operandi for the rest of the clubs, it's going to be the case that now when I swing, those Vs are going to come up when I swing. And so therefore, by virtue of the grip and setting and having the club in my center, I'm going to achieve center. I'm going to achieve square club face at impact a lot of times. Mm -hmm. A lot. So, so having the club in our center and having a neutral grip will give you that square club face and impact. Mm -hmm. That's two. That's two. Number three, club swing direction of the target. Oh, you wrote that down. Good for you. you bet I did. <laughs> I, I hope everybody's this. listening writes this down because it's really valuable. Well, it's that's really the valuable. awesome part about problem. podcasts. They can go back and listen to this multiple times. They can rewind a little bit. <laughs> they can, you know, and, and we're going, I'm, listen, I know that we usually do this for 30 minutes. We're already up to 40 minutes and I'm not going to apologize for that because it's a podcast and I'm just enjoying this so much and learning so much. I'm going to just keep letting you go. So let's get up to number three here. Okay. So number three, we talked earlier and that was swinging the club to the target. How do we do that? Imagine that you are standing over a putt and your eyes are looking down at the ball. And I tell you, Fred, take your left hand off the club and point it at the hole. Take your left hand off the club, keep looking down at the ball, and point at the hole. Literally, yeah. forefinger point with your left hand if you're right-handed, straight down the line to the hole. Exactly, point at the hole. Okay. In order to do that, you would need to remember where the hole is. Mm-hmm. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to put your left hand back on the putter. And now I want you to swing so that the shaft of your putter, the shaft of the putter, points at that hole. Mm -hmm. When you do that, Fred, listen carefully. You'll hear the ball fall in the hole. <laughs> you From see, your mouth to the we God, went golf, to, golf God's ears. <laughs> if we went to the testing facilities, or Titleist, or Cobra, or Ping, or any of the manufacturers, where they, where they swing the clubs robotically, and we crank that robot just six inches at a time, as it passes impact and goes forward, there'll be a moment where the shaft of the club will be pointing right at that target. Mm -hmm. Just like when you and your buddy are out playing catch in the backyard, there's a moment where your forearm pointed right at him. If we attempt to swing that club so it points at the target, we will have swung it along the path of the target line. And therefore, the only energy being imparted to that ball is toward the target. And because of the way we've set up, that club face is going to be square. So the ball is going to leave the club face perpendicular to the club face. The club face is going to be perpendicular to the target line. And the energy you're creating is along the target line. That ball is going to the target. What of those three things have to do with your hips? Hmm has to do with your shoulders. Which of those three things has to do with your spine angle? Has to do with your foot placement? None. None. Man, um, well, I read a bunch of the reviews about Heartland Golf Schools, and uh, <laughs> they weren't lying. <laughs> they must have walked away with uh, a tremendous amount of success and confidence in their swing when they left. It's, you know, and again, I want to give the credit back to Manuel. Mm -hmm. uh, I want his legacy to be, to be worthy of the work that he did. But it's just terrific when you have a person use a golf club with the instructions like they use for every other tool. All of a sudden, 
they see the golfer that they thought they should have been. They see that golfer. Mm -hmm. And, and there is nothing that's more gratifying than help a person realize the potential they thought they had uh, and to think they might enjoy going out and playing golf. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great satisfaction for the teacher. Absolutely. It's, uh, the, um, the PGA has, uh, PGM programs, uh, at various universities around the country, um, where aspiring uh, individuals can go and get a business degree and get their PGA car. One of those schools is the University of New Mexico uh, at Las Vegas, at uh, Las Cruces. And um, I've been going out there now for about a year and a half, uh, twice a year. So I've been out there five times now um, to teach the new golf instructors coming up through the ranks about club focus instruction. Nice. Um, for the purpose of one, having them experience how it benefits their game, but then also helping them understand how do you teach this? How do you teach it? Because it's very different than what all of them have learned as they begin learning golf. And what's interesting is to see the relief on their faces and the enthusiasm they have when they realize that this makes sense for the first time. So much that we've been taught in golf is just hitting down on the golf ball. Oh, I love that one. You know, hit down on the golf ball and the golf ball goes up. Fred, if you hit down on the golf ball, the golf ball goes down. <laughs> I'm sorry for laughing. No one's ever said that <laughs> in you know, almost 600 the, the thing conversations. Is that, you know, if you hit down on the golf ball, the golf ball goes down. What we want to do is recognize our target is forward. I want my energy not going down. When I swing, I'm swinging forward. I do with my golf swing what you do with your arm when you're tossing to your buddy. Now, your arm does descend as it goes from your back swing toward your buddy. But, but if you're teaching a young child to, to throw a ball, would you say move your arm down? Yeah. Or would you tell him move it forward? <laughs> you know, words make a difference. And when we play, it makes a difference to what we're telling ourselves. And when we swing that golf club, I want to feel like I'm swinging forward. Mm. Now, all of a sudden, I'm accelerating through the ball and I'm swinging the club to the target. I get speed and direction. It's a killer combination. Yeah. Wow. Ed LeBeau, uh, this, the heartlandgolfschools.com. Not the, but heartlandgolfschools.com. Where is it located? Where's your school? St. Louis, Missouri. In St. Louis? Mm -hmm. We're the uh, home of the first uh, uh, golf event at an Olympics. And, we had one and the Maryland, bowling hall and the bowling hall of fame. <laughs> <laughs> that too, yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, again, thank you. This has really been enlightening and terrifying. Um, but uh, people, if you know, being in in the heartland, being right there in St. Louis, from wherever you are in the country, you can get there fairly quickly. If this intrigues you and you want to get better and you want to learn more. And stop focusing on your body all the time. This may be the way for you to do it. Uh, this is this is just fabulous. Thank you so much, Ed. I, I appreciate it. And again, if uh, anybody wants to hear the conversation that I had with Manuel De La Torre, uh, episode number one eighty seven or episode number five sixty four, either one, you can go and, and listen to it. Uh, and I encourage you to do so because now that all the episodes of Golf Smart are available for free to everybody, you can go back and hear many, many conversations. You can listen to Golf Smarter every day of the week for a long time and not repeat yourself. <laughs> Ed, thanks so much hey, for joining I, us. Can I, uh, can I plug Manuel's book and DVD? Please do. Um, Understanding the Golf Swing by Manuel De La Torre. It's in book and DVD. So if you can't come to Heartland Golf Schools, pick up the book and DVD. It will get you started. If you like what you read, uh, come and we'll help you implement it. Now, did Ernest Jones do any publications or things that we can go back to find that he wrote? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Ernest has two books. 
uh, Swing the Club Head is one. I think that's still in print and you can get it on Amazon. Of course. Uh, but there's two of them. I can't recall. The other one is a derivative. They're both uh, kind of one with an earlier version of the second. They both have very similar content. Okay. All right. Well, that's the one to get. Ed, this is great. Thank you so much again for reaching out and for uh, explaining uh, and straightening us out and hopefully getting us to hit the ball straight where we want it to go. I love that. Fred, great talking to you. Hey, if you'd like to get a complete list of the Golf Smarter archives, do not use iTunes. They only go back to May of 2012, which is episode number 333. So there's a lot of solid information that isn't listed there. The complete list is a spreadsheet that includes the title, guest, date, and episode number. This list is available when you click on the Archives tab at GolfSmarter.com.